Hello again. My name's Andre, and with you, I've been looking at a series of lessons on argument and discussion. Argumentative writing, argumentative speech, and discursive writing and speech. Already we've looked at how logic is constructed, how it fits together. And then we looked at the kind of language which we can use to construct logical argument and discursive writing. Our focus today is going to be on substantiating that argument and also providing example to help that argument. Now what's important about that is that when you're trying to prove something to someone, when you're trying to persuade them, that you use substantiation and example in order to make your argument more highly effective. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to substantiate each point of your particular argument and select examples which will strengthen your argument. Now there's no doubt that we all have strong opinions and strong views on certain issues. And in addition to that, we'd like very much to be able to persuade other people that what we believe is the right thing to believe. So let's look at an everyday familiar situation and try to formulate a means by which to persuade someone of our point of view. Let's think about perhaps a situation in which there's a party you'd like to go to on Saturday night. Your parents insist that you should stay at home because they've invited the family over. Each side, you and your parents, would have a strong set of reasons and arguments to justify their own point of view. Let's take a look at what could be the potential arguments. You could say to your parents, I have to go because I'm old enough to be responsible. And you could say to them, you just want to control my life. On the other hand, your parents could say, you can't go because you never see your family and you're too young to go. Right, so before we look closely at these two arguments, let's just define something else. Each of the claims made both by you and your parents in this argument which you're having um, can be called premises. What a premise is, is a claim or a statement that has not yet been proven. In order to put forward a good argument, it's an idea to take the claims, the premises that you've made, and construct them into some sort of logical order, as we said before in lesson two. They need to follow logically from one another and build up towards a logical conclusion. And a good argument also has examples and proof to substantiate those premises. Right, so now let's go back to that argument that we made between you and your parents. And we'll start by looking at your argument. What we have here is two premises. I'm old enough to be responsible, and you just want to control my life. Now the problem is whether this fits into some kind of logical sequence. Are these two points connected? And let's have a look at them again. I'm old enough to be responsible, and you just want to control my life to prove why you have to go. I think you must agree that neither of these really has anything to do with why you have to go. Remember we spoke about logical construction and here the two premises are not in any way proven, in any way shown to be valid and there's the problem. Hence we start beginning to need substantiation and some example. Let's look then at your parents' argument. Right, so here your parents' argument, which reads, you can't go because firstly you never see your family, and secondly, you're too young to go. Now let's think about the logic of these two. There are words here which effectively make the argument invalid. There is also the tiny problem of the two points not being connected to, the, to each other at all. But let's look at the words. Here, a word never. Surely that's a bit exaggerated. It's not as though you never see your family, and I'm not sure that that really translates into a reason for why you shouldn't go. Now let's look at your parents' second point, the one which said you're too young to go. There is no logical connection between those two premises, do you see? 
let's remember the checklist we made. For a good argument, it must follow a logical sequence and build up towards a logical conclusion. In addition, a good argument must have examples and proof to substantiate the premises. So if we go a little further and look at how we can improve these two arguments. Here are the examples. In your parents' argument, the second premise they made was that you are too young to go. Now, if they had added an example, some kind of proof to that statement, to that premise, it would become far more persuasive. What if they had said, you're too young to go because there'll be alcohol there? We're starting to become more logical and more persuasive in that argument. Another example, if, for example, they had used, you reeked of smoke and drink the last time you came back, we would begin more and more to believe that their premise is valid. So what I'm saying is that logically, in terms of argument, a couple of substantiations, an example or two, is likely to make your argument far more persuasive. You're far more likely to be convinced by an argument which relates to you. Hence, give some example. Right, so what we've discussed up to this point is how arguments fit together. We've talked about a flow of logical thought and how we need to create that logical thought to prove a point. There is also another error, though, that is possible when arguing. And really what we call these errors is fallacies. Essentially, a fallacy is a claim that you've made which isn't valid. Uh, now, you know what validity means. It means that you can't trust that particular point. And effectively, we've divided those fallacies, those errors in argument, into two main areas. The first is where the claim is not relevant, therefore a fallacy of relevance. And the second is where the claim is ambiguous, a claim of ambiguity, a fallacy which is ambiguous. Let's talk about the first of these errors you can make, the fallacy of relevance. Now, what really happens there is that your claim is not supported by the reasons you're giving, so that the two are not connected to each other. Let's look at an example of this. The South African soccer team beat Denmark on Saturday, so it must be the best team in the world. I think we can all understand that the fact that South Africa beat Denmark this weekend doesn't necessarily make it the best team in the world. It certainly doesn't follow that the proof you've given, the victory in one game, necessarily proves the South African team as the best. But then there's the second type which we'd better talk about, ambiguity. Now the word means that you can derive more than one meaning from what is said. And the fallacy of ambiguity is when you've made a claim, you're providing some kind of support for that claim, which can be taken in many ways. In fact, the meaning is not clear at all. Let's look at one example of this type of error. She must be a good athlete if she's running the athletics union. So let's think about ambiguity here, where two meanings fit into this. Now we've used the word running, um, and you know, running can mean, well, either that you're physically moving quickly, that you're sort of going beyond a walk, but it can also mean to organize. Now because we've used the athletics union and that sort of area, the word running becomes confused because we've said she's an athlete, because she happens to be able to run an organization. She organizes well. It obviously doesn't follow that someone who organizes well is necessarily an athlete. I mean, I'd be an athlete in that case. So, effectively, in this sort of situation, you've got to choose your words very carefully so that not one of them, in this case running, can be taken in two ways. And the conclusion you draw, if you're being ambiguous, is almost always irrelevant and in in invalid. But before we go on, let's just recap the point we've just made. Be careful not to state a fallacy, a statement that is either irrelevant or ambiguous. So fallacies must be avoided. They tend to make your argument illogical or irrelevant. <laughs> right.
Right, so let's summarize all the things we've learned in this lesson. We started with logic and we took a quick look at how logical language and a logical progression should sound. Then we went one step further and we said, well, to prove our logic, we need to substantiate. We need to kind of argue that logic. Then, example, we decided, would certainly add to the validity of that argument. And then finally, we decided that errors, those fallacies of relevance or ambiguity, have to be avoided in our logical writing. Right, so now you've seen logic and you've seen what fallacies are. We've seen where we make mistakes and we've seen how to construct good argument. Now I want you to look and decide whether you can recognize the logic and the fallacy on your own. Here's your task for today. Which of these statements is logical? The first one, I will be a lawyer because there are two other lawyers in my family. The second option, Cars do not need to be able to go faster, as the speed limit is 120 kilometers an hour. And then the third one, no animals deserve to be in zoos, since zoos cage animals. Right, so now you're going to look at things around you and listen to things around you, and you're going to realize that a lot of what we hear is not that logical. When we read things in newspapers, they sometimes aren't that logical. But I want you to be the exception. When you take the skills that you learned in this lesson, you're going, you're going to be able to persuade more effectively and think more logically. And this is no doubt going to help you throughout your future. And that's all we've really looked at today. But I'll see you again for another lesson. Goodbye.